We've got a great season this year. Uh, we've got Katie Camillo, Amor Tolls, and Minnesota's own William Kent Kruger. And of course, tonight we have Lauren Groff. It's going to be a fantastic evening. We couldn't have a season like this without our sponsors. So thanks to Bremer Bank and Becker Furniture World for their support. And we couldn't do it without the members of NPR and the subscribers of Star Tribune. So thanks to anyone who is a member or a subscriber. Now, in response to the current state of the COVID pandemic, there will be no book signing, but Lauren Groff did pre-sign some books. They're out in the hallway and Subtext Bookstore, it's a fantastic bookstore in, here in St. Paul, is selling the books. I picked up one there um, from them and she has them. They're all pre-signed by her. So pick one up. Now I would like to bring out my friend, my partner in Talking Volumes, Tim Campbell, Senior Editor for Arts and Entertainment at the Star Tribune. Hey, Tim, Steph. What have you got for us? Thank you all for being here. Lauren is going to be great. I'm so glad that you could make it here. This is really, it's it's been like two years since I put these shoes on. So. <laughs> they really kind of hurt. So if you see me with my socks on out in the audience, that's why. All right. So do you have anything you want to say about what the Star Tribune has coming up or anything interesting? Yeah. Uh, this weekend is our big fall arts preview. Ooh. We pulled a bunch of people in the art scene around town, asked them you know, what their lessons learned from the, the last year and a half were, what they're looking forward to, what they're afraid of. Um, and one of the big things, which we're leading off the section with, is an interview with our next Talking Volumes guest, Kate DiCamillo. Great. We'll pick, I'll pick that up and read yeah, it this weekend. Yeah, and uh, thank you for being such good readers. And email us at books at Star Tribune if you have a book that you'd like to, us to take note of. We actually read uh, what we get in the email, and sometimes we even print it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. All right. It is now my pleasure. I'm so happy to be able to say this. Please welcome Carrie Miller, the host of Talking Volumes. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Fitzgerald Theater. The masked and the mighty, right? That's what we are. Thank you so much for coming out. We just, as we planned the season, we didn't know what this was going to be like. We hoped some people would be brave enough to turn out. And we knew that, of course, we're recording the event and we'll be broadcasting it several times. So for people that didn't feel like they could come, they'll get to have the experience of this as well. We are a room full of kindred spirits and book lovers. And I don't know what I would have done this year without reading and books. I'd love it. I see a lot of nods here. Call out a few titles that you read in the last 18 months to keep you going. Just cut. Dan Jelton, I know you read something. Overstory by Richard Powers. Yes, sir. Ham Maggie O'Farrell, I just listened to that. I'm so glad you, yes, ma'am. A Paragon? A Colin McCann. Wonderful, wow, such good taste. Anybody else want to add to the list? I, I didn't catch that? Memorial Drive. Memorial Drive. What, Kesey Lehman? No, it's by Natasha. Ah, thank you. Wonderful. Yes, ma'am. That's uh, the Hour of the Witch. Those masks are kind of getting in the way. <laughs> I, I cannot. <laughs> I didn't think about that, did I? Uh, our guest says that she was a shy child who grew up preferring books to people, and that might still be the case. She told me downstairs she will not like that I am breaking her confidence, but she reads 300 books a year. Whoa. Right, I thought I was special. I'm nothing compared to what she reads. She also sounds like she was a promiscuous reader in the best sense of the word, as a child, and that that curiosity continues to animate her writing. Lauren Groff is the author of Arcadia and Fates and Furies, among other books. Boy, I hope you read that one. Her wonderful new novel is titled Matrix. Please give her the warmest of welcomes to the Fitzgerald Theater. <laughs> Thank you.
Is it all right that I told the tale of 300 books a year? Absolutely not. No? All right. <laughs> See, what we say in the green room does not stay in the green room. I, should, I need a sign down there for that. Um, maybe promiscuous isn't the word you want to be associated with in any kind of context, but it sounds like you have always had a kind of restless and curious mind for reading. So I would, I'd love to know about the moments as a, as a kid when you realized that books open the world. You could read anything, you could be anyone, you could step into any character's footsteps and live that kind of life. Do you yeah. remember it? There, there were a number of them for sure, right? I, um, I used to go to the library sale in Cooperstown, New York, which is where I'm from, and just load up my frequent flyer with all of the dog-eared <laughs> and sort of smelly dog, well, silver-fished books, um, and just bring them home. And a lot of it was aspirational reading. I mean, I think uh, no eight-year-old is going to actually really understand War and Peace. Um, <laughs> that was ending up in the freak in the little was, flyer, yeah. red flyer. Yes, it oh was. Uh, but I read everything. I really did. I read everything off the shelves. I read Nancy Drew. I read Edith Han Hamilton's uh, Greek mythology. That really that sank in deep. Um, I read *Clan of the Cave Bear* by accident. Oh wow! And, like, <laughs> wow! By accident. Yeah, I was really young. I wasn't prepared. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. Everything. Everything. It was the way that I had of engaging with the world while also at the same time hiding from the world. Hiding yeah. from the world. Yes. How? Why? Oh, well, my, I have a very loud older brother, and I just wanted to hide from him. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're reading, people don't make you do chores, right? They're very proud of you. So it was great. Look at her. She's reading in the corner. <laughs> oh. You alone. must have also, you know, some, some librarians, I, I had an experience like this too in a very small town library as a kid, where the librarian said to my mother, She's reading beyond her age, and she really shouldn't be letting her do that. And my mother was like, let her read whatever she wants. And oh, it yeah. sounds like you had a similar deal. Yeah, my dad accidentally bought me the next few books after Clan of the Cave Bear, too. Really? <laughs> Those are really sketchy. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, no, my parents, any book that I wanted, um, you know, I, after 11, I had to buy them myself, but they just let me buy whatever I wanted. Yeah. Did you choose, I've been thinking about this a lot because I've been reading some interesting essays on this. Were you choosing books that were consciously, uh, you know, this kind of fits who I think I am as a girl? You knew where I was going with this. Yeah, not as a girl though. I think I, I really had no perception that I was necessarily a girl up until the point when I started playing sports. Uh, to, you know, I knew, I knew I was, obviously, <laughs> but I just never, I only wore shorts. Right, I was a tomboy, I was very athletic. I just sort of did my thing and read my books, um, tried to keep my brother from beating up on me. And then suddenly, you know, one year, I accidentally, re I accidentally read Lolita far too young. Oh my gosh. And that was actually the book that was the, the seed of sexuality, right? I, I read that and I looked around and I thought, oh my gosh, every girl my age is, I guess, sexual? Yeah. Um, ugh. Right? And, and How old were you? I was before 13. Oh my it was, gosh. Yeah. Wow. And that also went deep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, I wonder if, you know, we, what you think about the way we kind of instill these reading codes into boys and girls. Mm. I want to talk about your son's reading here in just a minute, mm -hmm. but there is still this perception that the way to get kids to read who might be reluctant readers are to give them books that are right for their gender. Hmm. Um, have you encountered that? What do you think about it? No, I, not with my own children. I, I just buy promiscuously um, as many books as possible and I just leave them in their paths. But also the, the best thing I ever did as a parent was to just ignore them a great deal. Um, so benign neglect is the <laughs> best way to raise to get a reader. Them to read? Yes. Why? Because they're bored. Uh, you know, I mean, if and I live in the middle of a city, so it's not like, I mean, they, they do go out and they play with their friends, but it's Florida, so they have like a 
two hour limit before they die of heat exhaustion. And so they come back in and I don't let them have screens. Um, they have toys, they have a lot of Legos, but after that's done, they have still have eight hours left in the day and they're going to fill it with reading. Right, Yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, as I said, I was, I was, I've been thinking about this, and I looked up this essay from Shannon Hall, Hale, who writes about um, reading uh, young kids, and she writes for the Washington Post, and she said this. So what happens to a culture that encourages girls to read books about boys, but shoes boys away from reading books about girls? What happens to a boy who's taught that he should be ashamed of reading a book about a girl? for feeling empathy for a girl, for trying to understand how she feels, for caring about her, what kind of a man does that boy grow up to be? Yeah. Concur? Absolutely. Um, yes, but I do have to say this, this crop of um, children and young adult uh, writers, they're so smart about this, and they really do mess with the borders. And I think that if you just expose your kids to everything, it, it, I, don't, I don't actually think that um, those borders really exist anymore. I think that the, really? I think the writers are, are just uh, breaking them down by their books. Yeah, when yeah. you say mess with the borders, what do you mean? Well, I mean, books for boys do exist. Um, books for girls apparently do exist. Yeah, but the, princesses the best, and kittens. I know, I've, I, princesses, we can get into <laughs> that. I hate that stuff. Why? Oh, come on. Oh, do tell. I, no, I mean, it's obvious. Um, no, but... If you're buying a smart book of any stripe, a smart book, a graphic novel um, for, for kids or for adults, right? I think kids can read well beyond their ages. Um, if you're buying a smart science fiction book, any sort of smart book, and you put them in front of your children, then they're going to enjoy it. I, I think that um, like, being an intentional buyer is, is very helpful. I think that um, writers um, are... are there, there are books on the side, but I'll, I think a lot of writers are writing for the entire audience. I don't think they're, they're writing the Babysitter's Club anymore. Right. Yeah. Right. What is it about the princess culture you can't stand? Oh, come on. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just want to hear you articulate <laughs> okay. it. Okay. Um, well, I mean, the princess culture is predicated on women being pretty over everything else, right? And uh, their utility is is based in um, it's just the way that they look. Um, Cinderella looks beautiful, and then she's worthy, right? I, I there's there's so there's nothing in that for the girl like the one that I was as a child who was a tomboy who didn't want to wear a dress, right? Who was really uncomfortable, who beat it back up on her brother, right? Um, there was just <laughs> nothing in that for, for a large portion of the, of the girls that I knew. So. And yet it's amazing how sticky no, no. That culture is. Pink is a bad color. Oh, the other on you, it's wonderful. <laughs> you look amazing. Well, I just don't like it myself. This on is me. not going as I thought no, it would. No, you look wonderful. <laughs> I just really put my foot in. <laughs> what? Pink bad. No, you look good in pink. Black, white, <laughs> pretty in pink, right? You didn't like that either. I'll bet. I don't remember it. <laughs> um, I'm interested in how you, we've been talking a bit about developing feminism, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. in, in girls and then fulfilling that as young women. I wonder how you thought about this idea of power and feminism in, the mat in Matrix compared to the way that you thought about it in Fates and Furies. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. worlds apart, very different settings and different characters, but it strikes me that there is like this beating core, this beating heart of your interest in feminism that comes through both of those novels. Oh, for sure. I mean, in Fates and Furies, the first book, the first part of the book was in the point of view of the male character, mm -hmm. and it was using a lot of narratives and kinds of narratives that have been seen throughout history, through the millennia of storytelling, right? So, um, 
there are courtly romances in there. There are, um, there's the campus novel in there. There's the buildings roman. So I actually intentionally chose these, these modes of storytelling that have been traditionally male um, in order to present this story. And then I tried to break them in the second half in the, the woman's point of view. Um, so, so, I mean, I think the similarity is that I'm trying to do the same thing in Matrix. I'm trying to break the uh, uh, sort of a, a, a masculine narrative storytelling um, mode, um, but I, I'm doing it in a slightly different way, which is by keeping men um, vague and sort of shadowy <laughs> figures on the corner of the vision, right? It's all a, a female gaze novel. Will you say something more about that, the female gaze novel sure. and deciding? I mean, was that, was that the conception from the beginning, that men would be marginal and blurry Mm -hmm. at the edges. Uh, the day before I had my vision of this book, I was coming back from Arizona on a plane going to Boston. And I, was wa I watched this amazing film, which I think a lot of people here have seen. It's called The Women. It's from 1940. I think it's a George Cukor film. Mm -hmm. I might be wrong about that. Um, it's so smart. It's so well written. The only characters are women. Right? There are no men in this film whatsoever. But uh, every conversation that the women have is circling a man or a mul multiple men. And it was so frustrating because it was like, you're 80% of the way there and you're just not quite, <laughs> you haven't hit it. Um, so the, the next day I go to this lecture and I hear my friend, Dr. Katie Bogus at Notre Dame give this talk and it's the most amazing talk about um, medieval nuns and their liturgies and the way that through the liturgical books they are able to sort of subvert a lot of the, the gender expectations of nuns at the time. I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh. And um, it, I was like quivering with joy because here this film and here this lecture and here this, this long-held two decades adoration of the first female poet in French, Marie de France, they all came together and sort of exploded into a, a vision of this, this book, Matrix. It's interesting that you actually call it a vision. It was is, is that how you think of it? Legitimately a vision. And this happens, you know, I've been writing seriously for 23 years now, um, which means every single day. In, that's what serious means in my small life um, and world. Um, but I think I've only been given a story maybe two times. I mean, and this is one of those times. And it almost never happens like this. And it feels like a gift when it does. So yeah. it felt like this film kind of arrives in your, on your dashboard. And then you go to this talk. Mm -hmm. And then the pieces are starting to come together. Or is mm -hmm. it more specific of a of a vision Well, that. I definitely I mean, sat in the audience and um, Marie de France definitely walked in. I mean, she definitely, like my vision really? of her, she, yeah, she walked in. I mean, not, so the, the great, great historical writer, uh, period writer, because she also writes contemporary novels, Hilary Mantel um, talks about how when she, she creates her characters, she has a chair here and a chair opposite, and she sits down in the chair here and she says, come, come sit with me. And Cromwell walks in and yes. begins to talk to her, right? And, and and so she talks to them like that. Um, and I am, I am not Hilary Mantel, but it did happen as I was sitting there that, that as I was listening and sort of having this ecstatic animal moments of, of just pure delight and joy, th this character did come to me, yeah. It's interesting that you've brought up Hilary Mantel um, because downstairs we were talking about Hamnet, which somebody called out that they had read, and I've just recently listened to it. Uh, this is Maggie O'Farrell's yes. novel that is doing what Hilary Mantel does in a way, too. And what you're doing here is rewriting what seems to be conventional history or conventional wisdom, such as it is, about, about these stories, again, with so often men at the center of them and giving us a new way to, re it's not just a new way to think about these historical figures, but to reorder 
the perception of these figures? You know, the, there's an incredible figure um, name, uh, in academia named Sadia Hartman, who's mm -hmm. really extraordinary. If you're interested, I would say, go look her up. Because she talks about, re and, and hers is mostly you know, African-American black writers, black figures, but she, she t and, and women, and she talks about coming back and, and sort of writing into the absences, into the gaps in, in oh, certain ways in order good. to illustrate um, the, the world um, in a different way and sort of give an alternate vision of, of the world as it may have been and maybe actually flesh things out a little bit better. Yeah. So what were those absences that you were... I mean, there, there's probably a lot of absence because I don't know that many of us know much about Marie de France. Yeah, the, the major void that I, I myself shared when I was going into this was just a very vague idea of what the 12th century was, it was like, right? <laughs> I mean, I think we all have this feeling that it was, sh lives were short and miserable and dirty and full of tooth abscesses, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just really unfortunate. Um, and they probably were. There was no antibiotics. There were no vaccines back then. There was um, a lot of lice, too. Yeah, there were a lot, so Ew. much lice, yeah. Uh, who knows, leprosy was yeah. big, a big deal. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, I mean, diseases were bad. Child, childbirth was absolutely perilous, um, horrible. Um, but at the same time, and I think that the, the sheer vision of the deficiencies in a 21st century vision of the world flattens our perception mm. of who people were at the time. And, I, and going back into the historical record, into ac the academic texts and, and sort of some of the reimaginings of the, of the time, I started to feel um, the movements of just humanity. I, I think that um, I, I remembered that people love making jokes, terrible fart jokes, right? So in the, in the corners of medieval manuscripts, often there are these things called drolleries, which are hilarious cartoons that, that you know, monks who are angry or something um, are writing in the, in the side, and they're so funny. <laughs> they're hilarious. Um, people loved sex. Right, we're animals, um, and and remembering that that was a part of life then too. When our perception is probably that everyone is walking around like with a halo in our hands, sort of canted together in prayer position, um, not true, right? People, people are are people, even if. The historical record generally presents the lives of kings and the lives of um, saints. Um, that's not the reality of the vast majority of people who were as complicated, as interesting, as wild as we are now. I, I'd really like you to describe the kind of feminist that Marie becomes, t turns into, with, with, I think, not a lot of... And, and she's young, but not a lot of self-knowledge at the beginning that there is potential, that, that this lies inside of her. How'd you think about it? So Marie is a character in my perception. This is all invented, by the way, because we don't know anything about the historical figure of Marie de France. We, we have suppositions. We have ideas that she could have been an abbess at the time. She could have been even one of the daughters of Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, we don't know. You know she was a poet. We, right? Well, we or know we... two things, okay. and the two things are the books that she left behind. She left behind a collection of lay, which are these extraordinary, just fantastical, wild, um, basically short stories in poetic form, and I love them so much. I've tried to do translations of them, and it has failed. Uh, and then she, uh, um, there are her fables, too, so she wrote these fables, and to be perfectly honest, some people think that she didn't actually write these fables, really? and other people say that there's a life of a saint that she might have written also. So we do know at least that she definitely wrote these lay. Um, so um, I didn't know much about her when she walked in all gawky, tall, unfortunate. The Angevin women had strange faces. Um, so she, she's an Angevin woman. Um, and 
Um, so I, I really took a lot of joy in the way that I created her life was I pulled from the text that we had imagery and ideas uh, that recurred and and then built a biography on top of that. So, so built sort of this, this um, her past life. And so out of this sort of invented biography through, I guess, the, the uh, um, biographical fallacy, um, I created this, this Marie figure who grew up in Le Mans um, in France, um, uh, speaking multiple different French languages of the time because it wasn't just French, right? It was, right. It was multiple different languages at the time. Learning to, uh, to do what well-born women at the time did, which is run vast estates. I mean, they had to be literate in multiple languages. They had to be numerate in ways that women just weren't at the time. They had to manage humans, uh, other humans, to, to work for them to make sure that these estates didn't um, crash down when the men were off, you know, gallivanting in Jerusalem. Um, <laughs> well, on the Crusades. So. Um, the, it was really exciting to think of her as this person who was uh, given this gift of um, knowledge and understanding at a time when women just weren't given those things. And to think of her perhaps as raised by uh, a bunch of um, aunts who went on the Second Crusade uh, as a part of Eleanor Vacutin's, uh Ladies' Army, which is definitely apocryphal, um, but there is in the historical record an idea that Eleanor had a bunch of ladies all dressed in silken white crusader uniforms with their red cross and their hair loose. And wow. You're right, and riding down the hills on these horses <laughs> and, and with their swords drawn. And I love that image so much. Like Even though it's probably apocryphal, it went in the book, um, as these, these sort of Virago Amazon ants um, were raising her. And so out of th that came Marie, who at, at, in the beginning, when she had to go to the court of Eleanor of Aquitaine and her um, uh, legitimate brother, she's a leg illegitimate bastard, um, she, um, M Marie sort of took into herself, because she's very young at the time, the ideas of courtly love, which are in some ways profoundly feminist ideas mm -hmm. for the time, in some ways, not at all, right? <laughs> and the narratives of courtly love sort of infused her. So as she's, she's thrown to the abbey, she sees the world framed in courtly love, ideas of courtly love. And um, so her feminism comes out of this, this tension, right? This tension between um, the, the way the world, sh she wants it to be, and the way that it, I guess, is under the auspices of the Catholic Church with the profound, deep hierarchies. Um, so her feminism comes out of just being trapped, to be perfectly honest, with her own beliefs in this very tight structure. I'm so glad you described it like that, because I was thinking the balance here for you is to um, not impose your concept of feminism today, which I guess would be a natural desire to do that, but to make this seem so, I guess, organic in that world that she lived in, as restrained as it was. Yeah, at the same time, though. <laughs> yeah. This is my, um, my theory of historical fiction, if I was going to do it, was that... I needed it to vibrate between past and present, mm. um, like a tuning fork, right? So the, the past and the present were constantly speaking back and forth. So even though I'm investing Marie with the 12th century, she's also coming from the 21st because the reader knows. The reader knows that this is a new book put out by me, and I was born in 1978, and therefore I was not alive then. Um, and therefore, there's this constant reverberation happening. And, and so I had to actually bring elements of modern feminism or uh, my belief in women um, into the 12th century where they may not have been organic. That's such a wonderful way to describe it. I've never thought of it like that. I mean, that seems where true masters of historical fiction get it right, right? That we will always, as the reader, have a contemporary sensibility, but we do want to lose ourselves, we think, in the, in the moment of the history. Yeah, so 
Um, <laughs> some people, like Henry James, hate historical fiction, right? I don't know if you know this, but um, he, he, um, he wrote this horrible, horrible letter to his friend, Sarah Orne Jewett, um, who sent him her work of historical fiction. And Henry James, being Henry James, said it so beautifully. But basically, what he said was, well, historical fiction is corrupt from the beginning, <laughs> right? just because it's all a masquerade and it's all false. Right? You're, you're just doing artifice the entire time. And um, so it cannot possibly be a moral art form. <laughs> um, which, can you imagine getting know, this letter? I know, being crushed, oh, yes. Oh like, my god, yeah. right? That would end oh, your writing career forever. right there. Forever, I, I know. Um, so there are people who believe that that's actually sort of some of the immorality of the form itself. But I actually believe that that's the profound morality of the form, because there's no novel that has ever been written that is not historical. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as is an ahistorical fiction. They're all based in history. Even, even fictions in, uh, sort of looking into the future are fictions that are set in the time of creation and the ideas at the time of creation. I was just gonna ask you though about, all right, something like science fiction yeah. also has kind of a historical element yeah. to it. Yeah. What about the tuning fork in a, in a form like that? Well, that's beautiful, right? So the tuning fork is, is being projected. It's, a, it's an imaginary tuning fork. And there's something very um, endearing, I think, about uh, science fiction, especially science fiction that you read 80 years later, because you see the limitations of the contemporary imagination um, in the way that uh, the, the 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 writer is imagining the the world of the future. I find it so wonderful. Do and, you read and, a lot of science fiction? No. Oh. Um, Wh but why? once in a while, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when uh, when I I lived in France for a year in between high school and college, and I was in Nantes, um, and Jules Verne is the like the animating force in Nantes, and so I read all of Jules Verne in French. Um, wow. And so that's like that's all I know basically about science fiction. Uh, plus whatever my children force me to read um, with our book club. Yeah. Very interesting to hear you say that there really is no novel that doesn't have that element of historical fiction. But when you set out to, to write this, were you, I mean, were you consciously plunging into a, a different kind of form that you'd I mean, that, that you were, yeah, yeah I, I'd, I'm interested in your awareness of this is something I haven't done before. This I is going to require different, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So, I ha so my first book spanned 200 years. I've written many, many short stories that are historically based. Um, I even, um, in Arcadia, uh, at the time, I think it came out in 2012, and the, the last part of it was set in 2019 when there was a huge that's right. pandemic. Yes, oh my gosh, that's right, right. I forgot that. Yeah, and, and like climate wow. change has really been exacerbated and people are walking around with masks on their faces, right? It's, I know, whoops. Yeah. I think I called it into being, <laughs> oh no, yeah. yeah. How much did you get right? A lot, all yeah. of it. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, one of the things that, that Marie and, and the novel inspired for me was kind of this tumble down a rabbit hole into the women who were writing in medieval Europe. And there were mm. some, which is mm -hmm. really remarkable. Mm -hmm. So I was reading about Julian of Norwich. Yes, all will be well and all shall be well. And okay, what do you know about well. her? She's a mystic, right? She's a brilliant mystic. And she wrote really, I read um, her work multiple times. You did? Doing. Yes, yeah. And what did that, I mean, to, to prepare for this or to? To prepare for a matrix. I, mean, I read all of the mystics. I love you all did. of the mystics. I love them so much. Yes, yes. To what, yeah. to kind of get the, that facet of Marie's personality, which I, I love the fact that she's not a full on mystic. Well, she, maybe. Who knows, right? Oh. I mean, can you actually um, be sure that all of the mystics of the past are full on mystics? <laughs> what is a full good on question. mystic? Right? Yeah, good question. I don't question. know. I do believe people like Hilde Hildegard von Bingen, who mm -hmm. is my favorite mystic, oh. if we're going to choose a team. Um, I, you know, I believe that she not only did 
get her visions as a gift, but she was also incredibly savvy and canny about spinning them to create um, more power for herself and more space for herself to move in this hyper paternalistic, oppressive society. Is this hers. Julian or this is Hildegard. Hildegard? Okay, yeah, I love Hildegard. Yeah, yeah. So I interrupted you. You were no. saying no. I just think that um, I think that it, they were so smart and such geniuses in multiple directions that um, possibly they could have not intentionally used, but maybe maybe intentionally used their visions to to promote themselves, to to have power, and to maintain that power, and to protect the women under them uh, for the abbesses of them. That is great because I think we have a tendency to think. There was a purity about, there's a saintliness, right? A purity about a woman who has visions in that era. And you're saying Maybe. it could have been a power move. Well, it probably was both, right? right? And it doesn't matter if it was both. And who knows? And who will ever know? But I like, I, but, but they got so much out of it, right? right? And obviously, there were people who... Um, saw the way that Julian was accepted and brought in and, and became famous, for yeah. instance, who also did what she did because it looked good, right? Like, <laughs> like, and they're lesser mystics, but they're still, you know, possibly real. How about Christine de Pazan? Yeah. Who was quite the feminist herself. Uh, yeah, the city of women, right? Yes. I think that's what she wrote. Yeah, um, I read that as I was actually building Arcadia. Uh, um, so it's been a very oh, long time. Oh, this has been, yeah. 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 So this has been germinating oh, for gosh. Yeah, yeah. a long time. Yes. How typical is that? Oh, very, yes. Most of, so most of my work has, um, been sitting somewhere, and this is such a silly metaphor, but my head is a planet, and the <laughs> ideas are satellites sort of spinning around, but they haven't yet found the way to fruition or the way to sort of become what they need to come, become. And so sometimes, you know, I will think, oh, it's the time, and I will artificially make uh, one of the satellites um, go on the page, and then it's dead. Um, and then I throw it back in, right? Is this and it's really how you think of this? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like legitimately. <laughs> um, and then sometimes I won't be thinking about it, and and I'll read something, or I'll experience something, or or I will be walking down the street and see something, and it will fall down and sort of collide and create a story. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's the way that my stories happen. And I know it's it, it seems silly, but. Often, a lot of my ideas are just have been spinning for a while, um, for years. It seems kind of mystical. Yeah, it in does. A way. I know. Doesn't it? Little <laughs> Lauren von Bingen. Yeah. yeah. Would you read the first? Oh, yes. the, the the first pages of the novel are so vivid and sensual, and this is so interesting because the setting that we are going into is austere, and we'll talk about that. I'd love, I love the way Lauren was clearly thinking about the contrast of that. <laughs> so would you read the first few pages? Sure. She rides out of the forest alone, 17 years old in the cold March drizzle, Marie, who comes from France. It is 1158, and the world bears the weariness of late Lent. Soon it will be Easter, which arrives early this year. In the fields, the seeds uncurl in the dark, cold soil, ready to punch into the freer air. She sees for the first time the abbey, pale and aloof on a rise in this damp valley, the clouds drawn up from the ocean and wrung against the hills in constant rainfall. Most of the year, this place is emerald and sapphire, bursting under dampness, thick with sheep and chaffinches and newts, delicate mushrooms poking from the rich soil. But now, in late winter, all is gray and full of shadows. Her old war horse glumly plods along, and a merlin shivers in its wicker mew on the box mounted behind her. The wind hushes. The trees cease stirring. Murray feels that the whole countryside is watching her move through it. She is tall, a giantess of a maiden, and her elbows and knees stick out ungainly. The fine rain gathers until it runs in rivulets down her sealskin cloak and darkens her green headcloths to black. Her stark, angevin face holds no beauty, only canniness and passion yet unchecked. 
It is wet with rain, not tears. She's yet to cry for having been thrown to the dogs. Two days earlier, Queen Eleanor had appeared in the doorway of Marie's chamber, all bosom and golden hair and sable fur lining the blue robe and jewels dripping from ears and wrists in shining chaplet and perfumes strong enough to knock a soul to the ground. Her intention was always to disarm by stunning. Her ladies stood behind her, hiding their smiles. Among these traitors was Marie's own half-sister, a bastardess sibling of the crown just like Marie, the sum of errant paternal lusts. But this simpering creature, having understood the uses of popularity in the court, had blanched and run from Marie's attempts to befriend her. She would one day become a princess of the Welsh. Marie curtsies clumsily, and Eleanor glided into the room, her nostrils twitching. The queen said that she had news. Oh, what delightful news. What relief. She had just now received the papal dispensation. The poor horse had exploded its heart. It had galloped so fast to bring it here this morning that, due to her, the queen's own efforts over these months, this poor illegitimate Marie from nowhere in Lemen had at last been made prioress of a royal abbey. Wasn't that wonderful? Now at last they knew what to do with this odd half-sister to the crown. Now they had a use for Marie at last. The queen's heavily lined eyes rested upon Marie for a moment, then moved to the high window that overlooked the gardens, where the shutters were thrust open so Marie could stand on her toes and watch people walking outside. When her mouth could move, she said thickly that she was grateful to the queen for the radiance of her attention, but oh no, she could not be a nun. She was unworthy. And besides, she had no godly vocation whatsoever in any way at all. And it was true, the religion she was raised in had always seemed vaguely foolish to her, if rich with mystery and ceremony. For why should babies be born into sin? Why should she pray to the invisible forces? Why would God be a trinity? Why should she, who felt her greatness hot in her blood, be considered lesser because the first woman was molded from a rib and ate a fruit and thus lost lazy Eden? It was senseless. Her faith had twisted very early in her childhood. It would slowly grow ever more bent into its geometry until it was its own angular, majestic thing. But at 17, in the spare chamber at the court in Westminster, she could be no equal to the elegant and story-loving queen who, though small in body, absorbed all light, all thought from Marie's head, all breath from her lungs. It's not time to walk, so I ran with you. Said it's not time to run, so I looked back and flew with you. The sun beams on my back as we pass a pack of wild horses running north. You assured me the one falling behind would make it too. to be worshipped and longed for, to love, cherish, and write songs for, to shine in the dark in a dream of our making. Take me now or take me home, I'm yours for the taking. Strange times I feel heavy, winter stole something from me. But I don't want to forget you, I'd sooner just sleep. You swell up inside me and plant a small seed in a garden of lilacs falls just out of reach. I'd sooner be alone than make love to your shadow. Am I not worthy anymore? Have I not bore you a son? FPA. Gorgeous. 
Um, so I mentioned that word sensual in the, in, from those first several pages, and um, there is such a contrast through the, the lushness of your writing these, I mean, I always get this sense when I'm reading your work that the words feel good to say. You know, there's just, yes? Yes, yeah. You think about that? I speak it out loud you a do. lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what are you looking for and what are you looking to hear when you're doing that? That's a good question. I think um, a, a, a large part of my writing process is really just remembering that I'm an animal and my characters are animals, right? And it's sort of grounding everything in the body, which means that not only do the words have to, to sound right for what's happening, so maybe a harsher scene would have harsher sounds, mm -hmm. but it's also remembering um, that embedded within sound and, and um, semantics and syntax, there are uh, bodily memories, right? Mm -hmm. And so sort of tactile, auditory, um, even other senses are embedded in words too. Right. And sort of, and trying to, to evoke these things, not just on the surface of what the words mean, but also with those, um, that network, that those those cobwebs underneath of almost invisible meaning, uh, that are really really necessary to evoke as well. When you say you remember that you're an animal, do you do you mean, and that in an animal kind of earthy kind of way, our senses are activated, and you don't want to forget to activate our senses in these portraits that you're creating. Well, yeah. Yes, absolutely. You know, um, a character is, should be a flesh and blood creation, right? And the way that the, the body reacts to anything is going to manifest in the way that the character acts mm -hmm. and thinks and becomes. And so, um, say, for instance, just as an example, there's a very tense breakup scene, and the breakup scene happens alternately on a beach at a very at a luxury resort, um, or that breakup scene happens in negative twenty degrees in St. Paul when it's like <laughs> winter and like the streets are frozen over, and one of the characters has forgotten their slippers inside the house, right? So they're going to be profoundly different scenes, right? They're, and because the characters, even if they're the same characters, are going to, to react in, in animal ways in different ways. So there's no such thing as consistency of character. Um, a character is relative, constantly relative, dependent on the way that the, the animal senses are being invoked. Mm -hmm. So the contrast between the austerity of the setting, and you, you bring us into that in the first few pages, and I think you, I got the sense you kept coming back to touch base on that, and then the lushness of Marie's observations, and then the world that she creates. I, I'd love to hear you say something about how you found the balance there, how you were thinking about it. Yeah. Um, all of my work goes through a rigorous process of failure. So, uh, <laughs> just rigorous failure over and over again. Um, what, what does that yeah. mean? Oh, oh gosh. Um, so my propensity, we were talking about this earlier, my propensity is to control everything and to be a perfectionist and to sort of, to, to make everything, lock everything down immediately, right? Because I'm very anxious. <laughs> um, but I think into my process, I have to build a great deal of uncertainty mm -hmm. and a great deal of intentional failure. So for instance, I write everything longhand um, up until the very, very, very last draft. And I write fast drafts in the beginning because that means that I can't stop because I can't reread my handwriting um, because it's really horrendous. Um, and, but it also means that I just keep going. You, gotta, you have to just keep going. You can't let my, my, I can't let my personality stop me. Uh, you got to outthink your own personality sometimes. And so, um, so the failure is intentional in the, in the first many drafts because I am not trying to write something good. 
Um, I'm in fact trying to write something bad but fast and, and interesting um, only on the level of ideas, not on the level of words. And so as each draft progresses, and I throw it out completely, I start over again, I do this as many times as I need to, with this book is probably eight separate, complete, throughout restart um, drafts. And what that does is, it does many, many interesting, fun things, as long as I can mitigate the frustration. Um, but it, it, um, it builds a book in a different way. It, it builds a scene um, by layering, right? Mm -hmm. Almost like a 3D printer, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, you know, you have to live within the scene and only build it. I have a lot of friends who are the precise kind of writer who they write a sentence and it's perfect and then they move on to the next sentence and then they hand in their books and they have three things wrong. Um, and I don't envy them, but I think that's wild, <laughs> um, right? Um, but the way that, with with the intentional failure, the intentional coming back to some to an idea and seeing it from a different place, with um, the exigencies of the next draft and what that means, the next structure, the next um, um, change in characters, it all it just develops a bit more under the surface, I think, and and then finally the surface comes at the very end. You know, when you're describing that uncertainty, I was thinking you have. You have to have confidence in that uncertainty, which is a pretty astonishing thing. Yeah. It couldn't have been there at the beginning. Oh God, no, 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 no! But I did know at a certain something ha happened um, uh, when I first started writing that made me think this is the thing I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And so, um, no half measures. Just do it as hard as you can um, until you don't get to do it anymore. Um, so even if I didn't have the necessary confidence, and I shouldn't have because my, fr my first 10 years were full of wretched work, um, <laughs> I still pretended, right? I pretend, I, you know, it was the most important thing in my life, so I got up and treated it as if it was, mm -hmm. yeah. Uncertainty is a good, a good segue here, because I, I wanted to talk to you about Marie's faith. I found it so interesting, and mm. I really wondered how much consideration you gave to what she believed and what the reader would think she believed. Will, will you talk about that? And then I have some other questions about it. Yeah, it's an arc throughout the book, right? We see her start at a place that's relatively um, secular because she wasn't really raised. I mean, she was raised going to chapel at her family's estate every single um, Sunday listening to mass and taking you know taking communion but i think that for this particular character she would rather have been out you know hunting frogs and, and swimming in the river naked right so um this was something that was almost an impediment to who she wanted to be mm -hmm. at any given time and then she was forced to take on the role of first prioress and then later abbess in this abbey and so she not only had to live within the liturgical schedule was really rigorous for Benedictine nuns at the time. I mean, they had to pray many times a day, and every aspect of life was prayer, right? So the work was prayer, everything was prayer. Um, so she had to take in the, the very rich and very beautiful calendars and schedules and things like that, and um, the, the, the way that they prayed every, at all times. And I think it's slowly built into a faith um, that was probably separate from her sister's faith, mm -hmm. um, but no less deep and complex and interesting. I mean, what, what's intriguing is, you know, she, as we heard in that first excerpt, she finds a certain kind of foolishness and she bring, she comes into this with skepticism. Mm -hmm. A lot of good questions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And out of that comes, I guess, what I read as a more authentic faith. What, what do you mm -hmm. think? I don't know if it's more authentic. I don't, you know, I, I would, I, it's one of those things where I don't think you can compare faith because it's so abstract, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, I think as long as um, you're committed to it, it is what it is and it's beautiful, right? I think she slowly commits to it, to, to whatever it is that it has built in her and has become its own beautiful thing. So um, by the end of the book, she is, powerful in her weird idiosyncratic faith. Yeah. yeah. And why? 
Why powerful? Or no, why? why? Why is that where this character's belief, you know, tenets of belief went? I think she sees God in the people around her, right? And per perhaps God doesn't exist in the stories as received from where she heard them, but she sees these beautiful, smart, um, unusual women around her, and she can she can see that what the Quakers call that um, the spark of light, right, mm -hmm. inside. I think she she genuinely believes in the God in the love of her sisters. Yeah, I mean, it kind of brings us back to those other medieval women who were writing, and how their they allowed their faith to be perceived mm -hmm. as you know, deep and appropriate for that time, but again, how that might have been quite useful. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I, I mean, I believe them very, very fully, that they very much believed. And, and uh, sort of um, a lot of the, the saints came out of fervent belief, right? Almost overwhelming passion that, that did overwhelm, that, that did take them over. Um, and, and, it's not, it's not an either or mm -hmm. situation, right? It's an and situation. And it became very helpful for that, some of them to um, get wealthy donors, right? <laughs> like, so, um, right. so, so um, I think both things can exist at the same time. Is there an element of you asking questions about what people believe, whether that is of mm -hmm religious, uh, of a religious nature, is there an element? It seems like there is in a lot of your writing. I feel like yeah. that was present in Arcadia. Some measure of it was present in Fates and Furies. What do you, am I just making stuff up? Or? No, um, but I've never thought about it like this, so I've got to spin a little. Um, I think um, at the heart of all my work is, um, not a dissatisfaction, but a hunger uh, for better, um, for, for living better and being in a better world and creating something. It has to be better than what we have now. <laughs> um, and that, um, I think that manifests in constantly sort of uh, um, tapping with a ball-peen hammer at what we do have and what the characters do have. There's a constant sort of oppositional force mm -hmm. against everything, the situations in which they find themselves. So um, I, I, I think the answer to your question is yes, and the other answer to the question is I have no idea, but I feel like that's maybe the truth. Yes. I mean, yeah. I, I get the sense that there's there's idealism mm -hmm. in in many of the novels that I've read of yours and that and this is an interesting um, this is something that's interesting to behold too as a reader right when that idealism starts to crack mm -hmm. and diminish mm -hmm. I was curious about how yeah. you think about imbuing these characters with that kind of idealism and then what it takes to chip away at that. Yeah. Um, or what is worthy left behind after idealism falls, right? Yeah, um, right. Because there is something there that is, is worthy and beautiful and noble. Um, especially, I'm thinking now of Arcadia, actually, and Fates and Furies, right? What happens when all of the the illusions that we hold um, fall away. What is left? And, and is it worthy? And I think my ultimate answer is obviously yes. I, I believe very deeply that it is. But why is one of the questions that I think that I'm constantly looking at in, in my work and, and trying to get there. I'm trying to, um, I think one would not ever sit down to write a novel unless there were shadowy places in one's own human hearts that um, uh, as of yet have not borne up under any kind of scrutiny. And so the, the act of the novelist is to try to shine light into it, try to see what's, what's deep down in there. And I think that's one of those 
um, fundamental questions that probably goes down to my own personal faith and and if what my faith is in humanity, um, which sounds very very large and scary, but I, I think that's what I'm doing in my work. I'm I'm just trying to understand if we are worthy, and I think we are. I don't know. Do you have? Are you comfortable with the idea of illusion or sometimes I get the sense that you have a real impatience with the idea of illusion? No, um, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I think I like illusion uh, up to a certain point, but I don't like unjust illusion or I don't like it when um, it's there for the sake of tri tricking, tricking, right? I, I, I like it for um, mystery. Uh, I like ambiguity sometimes. Yeah. But how about, how about kind of um, self-preserving illusion? Yeah. I mean, in Fates and Furies, boy, does that get stripped away mm -hmm. pretty fast in the second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's so much that I don't like illusion, um, insofar as I think that uh, the only thing we have is attention and paying attention, and the closer attention you pay, the less illusion matters, right? I, I think if, if you are able to um, look as hard as you can at all times. Oh, there's this amazing George Eliot quote that I would massacre um, about the squirrel's heart beating and the grass growing. Um, but if you, if you were to pay as close attention as possible, you get come close to the quick of life and you come close to understanding the great mysteries uh, that there are in the world. Um, so I think illusion is really just a barrier to close attention. So I think the answer then is... Probably. You are kind of impatient <laughs> with illusion. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And that, you're th <laughs> that in your... In your writing, it's, it seems like part of the process is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Stripping it away. I hope so, yeah. In a necessary kind of way. Yeah, yeah, that's very, I have to go home and actually think about that. <laughs> <laughs> this is like a very, very difficult question on the spot. I have a question for you about the Brontes. Because oh, good. I read that you have read the entire Bronte canon. All of the Brontes. Yeah, no, I have. Is it Branwell? Who's the, oh, yeah. who's the, guy? the guy? Have you read his? <laughs> that, mm, Bran <laughs> like, poor yeah. Branwell. Mm. <laughs> right. I mean, compared to his sisters, he was not, uh, he was not the brightest, right. the best. Oh, yeah. I know. They were, he was definitely the mope uh, of the family, the, wasn't he? Mm, <laughs> Sorry, like you have to make that face. With. I mean, even in the in the portraits of Bromwell, he's sort of like wilting off to the yes, side. Yes, right, yeah. right. He couldn't compete. <laughs> Not at all. But they had illusions about him. I oh, think. Oh, big didn't time. They? Oh, they did. They Isn't thought that interesting? Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that came from the father and his prejudice against yeah. his daughters. But but mm. I think it is interesting that these <clears throat> women who paid close attention mm -hmm. and wrote novels about how they were paying close attention, allowed themselves these illusions. I guess that's love yeah, in a family. Yeah, it was love. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they profoundly loved him. You, you have read the whole canon, though. I have. I mean, it, a lot of them were a long time ago, so, yeah. Yeah. Are you going to ask it like a very specific question? Because oh, I'm yeah. freaking out. No, it's a Bronte <laughs> quiz from now on. No. Can't wait. No! Ugh. Do you have a favorite? Villette. Why? I don't oh. know. I, there's a scene um, <laughs> of drunkenness <laughs> in a public place that is hilarious and weird and like magnificent, and it's just the thing that I think of when I think of the Brontes. <laughs> <laughs> that is not the thing I think of I know. when I think I of the love Brontes. That book. Okay, I've got to go back. I read that a long, long time ago. I'm going to ask you the question that I asked our friends in the audience. Um, in the last 18 months, are there just a couple of books that have really 
gotten you through? Absolutely. What what are they? So I have this uh, re uh, reading group of three. It's only three of us. Three um, friends. Three, or three friends. Family. Yeah, yeah, and we've attacked some really amazing books together. We um, we read Life and Fate by Vasily Grossman. We read Don Quixote together. Um, but the one that I wake up thinking about, that often I go to sleep thinking about, is Roberta Bolaño's 2666, which I read when it first came out, but I was not ready for it until, and this time, I think it smashed my complacency, complacency with the world, right? It made me complicit with the evil in, in the world of the book in a way that I've never seen before by any writer. It, um, it broke me, yeah, in a good way. Breaking is good in my world. Sounds very no, breaking is good. They... Like we like to break Whoa. in my world. It the cracks changed... are the way the light gets in, right, Leonard Cohen? It, it yeah. changed what the the experience you were ha that we've all been having in these last eighteen months, or something larger about the world. So I think I was fearing that literature didn't um, was not up to the task of dealing with what we were going through. Right? It felt so insignificant and. Um, almost like a toy in, in sort of thrown against a tsunami, right? It, it just felt not enough. And then I read this book that showed me just how the profound the moral stakes can be if you're doing it right mm -hmm. in the way that Bolaño is. And it is the most urgent thing. So it gave, I think it possibly just gave me faith in art again, in a way that I had um, not lost entirely, but I was afraid I had lost. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because it sounds like you were not reading for away from what we were living every day. You were reading deeper into it. Yeah, I, I um, I love escapism, but I choose my escapism to be Netflix instead oh. of books. Books are uh, very serious to me. They are at the core of my life and existence. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, no, I'm not an escapist when it comes to books. I think it just, just as we close here, I think it'd be interesting for the audience to hear um, what kind of how you compartmentalize your day and where reading fits into that. Could you say that? Yeah, sure. I, um, I work very, very hard to work against uh, my natural propensity. <laughs> so I wake up at five, I get coffee, and I go straight to work because I'm still asleep when, I'm, when I start writing. And I think a lot of times we get in our own way psychologically. And so I'm already working and I'm already writing. And often, and every single day, I will give myself at least an hour where I have to, to put words on a page. Sometimes it is um, great and I'm having so much fun, I don't stop for eight hours. Sometimes it is horrific and I have to write um, exactly 50 sentences <laughs> and some of those sentences are oh, the F word. Like, like, <laughs> right, like, here is where I write the F word again. Um, but at least I'm doing it. And then at the end of that horrible, difficult hour, which I had many of this year, I let myself read because reading is also writing, right? Reading with intention, with attention, with, with um, love, and uh, with a seeking nature is as important to writing as actually putting the words down, too. OK. For our last excerpt, if you'll find that, and I will do this. I'm Carrie Miller, and you're listening to Talking Volumes at the Fitzgerald Theater. We're here with writer Lauren Groff, and her new novel is Matrix. Yes. In the dimness of the doorway, Eleanor looked young, but now, as she steps near the fire, she shows the fine wrinkles under her powder and the hump of her back that has begun to grow. Her perfume's so strong, it is the avant-garde of her attack. And the world silences in Marie's ears, all she can hear is her thumping heart. She casts inside herself at a loss. If beauty has been stripped from the most beautiful, grace from the most gracious, does that mean God's favor has been stripped away as well? Without preamble, Eleanor says, well, it has been decades, and hasn't Marie become a great mountain of a woman? She tells her to sit, if sitting doesn't break her chair, that is. No longer gallows bird is Marie, she who had once been frightfully bony. Oh, my, oh, my. Marie smiles. 
The queen looks at her. She says in a musing voice that, no, perhaps these decades Marie has become a sphinx. Marie says that they do eat well at the Abbey, that this place is not the starving place it had been when she arrived as a girl that Eleanor threw, herself, threw away. These weeks when Marie watched those little baby oblates go blue and waste away of their hunger. They do eat well and plentifully, though, of course, none of the nuns are fat. Nearly all of the nuns have a tremendous muscles. Perhaps the queen is simply just unused to female strength. Or perhaps it has been so long since Eleanor's lady's army that she has forgotten. Perhaps any woman who is not so frail that she would shatter with a shout would seem fat at least to one so refined and courtly as the queen. It is as though the queen cannot hear her. She says in a musing voice, that is not as though Marie was ever small, is it? Her bones had simply been unfleshed all those years ago. Now she carries her own armor under her habits. Yes, she would say Marie has become a great old monoceros, hide of iron, single vicious horn, or so she hears. Monoceros, yes, this is exact. <laughs> That 
is beautiful. Oh FPA. Thank wow. you. So we have masked microphone holders who are going to come out into the audience. And this is a chance to ask Lauren a question. There these guys are, Tim and Tom. Raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. And I'll just mention that Lauren signed books before the show. And please go buy them because subtext, my pal Matt Kelleher is out there and selling books out in the, uh, in the lobby. We love our independent bookstores. Yes. Yes. So. We need them to be healthy and well. You can yes. support them by <gasps> buying a book if you want. I would. do have to tell you, you must order your Christmas books now because there's supply chain problems. So order all your books now. Excellent. I wasn't from aware Matt. of that. Yeah, it's big. It's a big deal. Yeah. Ah, yeah, from Matt at Subtext. Yes. Keep him busy. Or Birchbark. We love all them right. too. All right. Questions for Lauren. Hi, my name is Walter. I really love your short fiction. So I've been thinking about how to put your short fiction in conversation with the issues that you've raised in Matrix. And the two that really are jumping out at me are Ghost and Empties, simply because there's also nuns, and um, the, uh, the uh, story, the title story of Delicate Edible Birds. So I'm how do I articulate, articulate this? Um, the women in your short fiction are often kind of in the, as Marie says in that first excerpt that you read, also kind of in this um, same strange geometry that they're trying to fit themselves into or mm -hmm. break out of. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if you are ever cognizant of the difference in form and how it helps you address these kind of feminist yearnings or urges from your characters? It's an utterly brilliant question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Um, I, the differences in the form is endlessly fascinating to me and I don't want to make you all fall asleep. Um, but I think, um, I, I think the difference for me is sort of the relative heat of the urgency. Um, so I think in the short story, because it's such an enclosed form and because it's um, necessarily enclosed, I think that you come to a boil much, much faster. And so the, the fundamental emotional uh, place where you are, um, it, it, it I think that when I go into writing a short story, I'm already, I already am at a simmer. And with a novel, it's like a slow rise to the boil. Um, and I think, it, I mean, there's so many, so many differences. I think uh, another thing too is, for me, a short story is much, much closer to poetry than it is to the novel. I think it, in terms of just the spectrum, it's, it's way, way over toward poetry. I started as a poet, a very bad poet, but I still started there. Um, so I, yeah, the other thing too is if you sort of see it as, as more, uh, more like poetry, and so therefore, um, if you're comfortable with ambiguities, right, that possibly get addressed over the long form, if you're comfortable with leaving some of the darkness that you're trying to address, I mean, it, it's 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 wildly different. Um, yeah, but honestly, I I won't. I won't sit down to start write anything. Write, I won't write anything unless I know the basic scope of, of what it will be. Yeah. So Thanks. do you find the constriction of the short story is its own you know, pleasure in? Immensely. Yeah? Yes. So the thing about poetry when I, when I was a poet is that I actually really, really loved form. Right? I loved writing a Sistina. I loved writing a Villanelle. Um, because what it, it requires you to think in, in ways unusual to the grooves of your mind. And so uh, you're starting to come up with ideas that are distant from the ones that you thought you were starting to do. And I think short stories with the, with the need to, to sort of finish on a canvas that you set out to finish on, um, it requires the same sort of wild spin of, of ideas and thoughts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Favorite short stories? I mean, what? 
Um, Joy Williams writes the greatest lines in short stories, I think. Um, there's so many, there's so many. Yeah. Questions right over there. Ah, uh, Sarah, hard to follow Walter, but um, I got a little, I read Florida and Arcadia, and I got a little stuck on the language with <laughs> Matrix, uh -huh. and I ended up having to listen to it to kind of get the rhythm, and was just curious, like, is that a cognizant process, or is it something that just kind of comes out of, like, pretending you're in the 12th century, or, like, I don't know, just how did you get there? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, you have to fit the language to what you're writing about. I wasn't trying to, to be in the 12th century. I was trying to, I, get, I did a lot in free and direct discourse here, and so there wasn't a lot of direct dialogue. And in fact, there's no direct dialogue. I wanted to avoid the oldie timiness of having to translate between the multiple languages that was that were happening at the time. So there, um, Marie would have spoken French, French, right? Um, but and she slowly learned English, and then she would be writing in Latin, and a great deal of uh, the language used during um, mass. Uh, I mean, I, all of it was Latin, and so just the the. Um, it would have felt wrong to my ear to have to leap from language to language or to have to explain, oh, now she's speaking in French, right? So um, it just felt false and artificial. So instead, my, my workaround was to put it all into indirect language. And, I, and for me, too, that, that built out of the story sort of a, a larger textural whole that more directly in, uh, was speaking toward the story that was happening too. It was making a tapestry where otherwise it would have felt um, like, a, like, like a, rough, a place with roughness in it. Yeah, yeah. If you have a question up in the balcony, Tim's up there with the microphone. So uh, question right down here. Hello. Oh, hi. Um, I think a lot of people who have never actually lived in Florida think of like beaches and Disney World. Um, I'm just curious how in Fates and Furies in Florida you capture that weirder, wild side of that area. Are you from Florida? <laughs> no, but I lived there for a couple of years. Oh yeah, so you get it. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, Florida's a place that I had to learn to appreciate. Um, it's, I, I still am learning on a daily basis <laughs> often. Uh, I live in the weirdest part of Florida. I don't live near beaches. I live in the swamp. And we have alligators all the time, and, and, just, uh, and possums and armadillos that are like little armored rats, <laughs> right, scurrying all over the place. Um, so I think part of my um, ability to live in Florida was uh, saying to myself, all right, get tough, Lauren pay attention, um, because I do think that the only way that I could have survived living there was trying to, to, to love it through attention. Um, and, and the way to do that is just to take delight in the way that it is just out of this world weird. And it is. It is out of this world weird. <laughs> um, and I, I, will never, I will never feel at home, but that's a good thing for a writer or an artist. It's always, it's good to feel a little bit um, spun off balance by the place that you live or the people you live among. Um, you don't want to feel comfortable. Comf comfort kills creativity. Weirdly, there is only one tiny, tiny bookstore in the town that yeah. Lauren lives in, so. Well, there's, there's, uh, yeah. It's not great. Well, you said only 200 books on the shelf. She, well, our independent bookstore has two to 300 books on the shelf when she's open. Yeah. 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 So we yeah. were talking about, should Lauren follow in Ann Patchett's And footsteps? Louise Erdrich's. And I Louise Erdrich. Right. I just need a good partner, because I'm not going to do any of the business. Anybody want to volunteer to? <laughs> no, then they'd have to move to Florida. <laughs> and then they have to live in Florida. Right. Uh, question right here. Hi, I'm Christina. And um, one thing that I noticed, um, I haven't gotten like all the way through Matrix yet, but in the first few pages, um, we've kind of talked about this a lot, but like the rich vocabulary, is that something that you like set out like specifically to do, or is that something that you think has just come to you with how many, you know, how many books you read? Oh, uh, yeah, my vocabulary is, um 
it's really just me taking profounds and fritter like pleasure in language, right? I am just, by the time I finally let myself play around with language, I'm like, Ugh, right? I'm so excited to do it. Right? I finally get to actually <laughs> do the thing that I have always wanted to do. Um, so, so it's just everything that's been building up in me sort of comes out finally, and I and I and I'm just I play with the length of the sentences, I play with the sounds, I play with the vocabulary. It's all just play. It's just joy and play. And by that you mean when you let yourself. When you've I let myself. worked your way through all yes. of this this other. Uh, fast draft, getting to somewhere. Now I've got the structure of the story. Yes. Now I get to do the thing and that I love. And you get to relax into it. And you feel like, um, I don't know if anyone has weighted blankets, but I have like a really, really heavy one. And so, because I'm very anxious, it's my thunder sheet. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes when you get up uh, from a weighted blanket, you feel like you're flying. That's sort of the way that you feel when you wow. release yourself into language. Yeah. I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> it's interesting. Uh, uh, right there in the front. Yeah, one of the one of the things in the last eighteen months that um, has been a little bit of a challenge uh, for me is is um, so many of the, the the sources of our like material comfort mm -hmm. in the world um, are also at the same time killing the planet. Um, when you think about like greenhouse gases caused by our nice air conditioning or whatever, right? And uh, something clicked when I when I when I heard you talk about people in the the twelfth century living rich and fulfilling lives without any of those things that mm -hmm. we can't imagine life without. Um, and I'm wondering if that's, uh, if that's something that, that, that you've considered, or it seems important to me to, to, mm -hmm. to communicate mm -hmm. that. Yeah, uh, I didn't know, because m my vision of the world is perhaps slightly darker than that, which is everywhere human is, humans are is climate change. And that has, it's not new. I mean, the first ancestor who learned that throwing a piece of flint at another piece of rock built a fire was engaging in climate change. It was turning this stick that otherwise would have been melting back into the forest floor feeding beetles and I don't know what else. Um, but it's turning that into carbon, right? And, and changing the climate. Uh, and perhaps that's, that is, dark, but at the same time, I know where you're coming from, and I would, I would agree with this. I do think that it's very, very necessary to remember that we do not need the things that we think that we need. Um, not all the things. I mean, I will keep vaccines. Thank you. Um, I will keep antibiotics. Um, you know, but air conditioning, even though I live in Florida, we can actually live without it. We really can. It's not a happy life. <laughs> it's not a well-scented life. Uh, everybody stinks a little bit, but people have done it in the past, uh, and we can do it again if we have to. But you're right. We're coming to a, an inflection point where we have to make these decisions, um, or else the children that we do have, the grandchildren that we do have, will not have any of the things that we take for granted. Our convenience is not worth their future. Yeah. Okay, Tim, oh, now you're back down here. Are these people in the second balcony because they don't want to ask questions? Like, There's don't one, bring right. the microphone up here to us. <laughs> you had mentioned uh, in passing earlier that there were only two characters that had sort of just come to you fully formed or, or, or just sort of appeared to you. Marie being one, who is the other? And, and, how, and who, who or she, she or he, what, what happened there? Well, there are two stories. I mean, the characters have come to me uh, before. So um, this story sort of came to me in rough form. I had to do a lot of work to get there. But um, a story in my first collection was a story that just sort of fell into my brain. Um, it, it's funny because you spend uh, a great deal of your life hoping for these moments, um, right, as a writer, and you're just like waiting. Ready, I'm ready for you. I know, and you're just waiting for it to come. Um, but I guess we all do workarounds when that doesn't happen, right? And that's, that's the beautiful part of it, is actually like sitting there and, and trying and failing and trying and failing. I actually think the failing is, is the most beautiful part of the writing. And so, not that I don't want more. <laughs> um, 
I would like more. Uh, um, but if they don't happen, that, that's okay too. I'm happy to work. Work is good. Yeah. I mean, she, we were talking about this in the green room that Lauren is remarkably sanguine about days where she's working, but it's not working. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Can I say it like that? Yes. Yeah. Because it, it will come back, right? The fallow times are meant to be, and they're meant to be in any creative endeavor, in any part of our lives. Um, we're not, we're not actually meant to be little capitalists, believe it or not. We don't have to produce all the time <laughs> um, and or produce good things all the time. That is actually not the way humans were meant to be. We were actually meant to work and then rest a great deal. Um, and, so, and so rethinking that and rebuilding that back into our creative practices can only make us stronger, I think. I was just thinking, I wonder how many writers who have sat in that chair would be that relaxed about it. I mean, it's... I get mad at myself, and then I go for a run, and then I cry, and then I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. one last question right here. Someone building on that topic is letting go, and you had mentioned in your process of writing, you might write eight drafts and throw it away, and then do you like literally throw it away and never look at yes. it again? Well, no, I put it in a box. In the, yeah. This is one of those aspects is like, how do you let go of something or you can't keep all the, wor the words that you write and yeah. that's incredibly challenging for someone to say, this is a great sentence, but nope, I'm not going to use it. Yes. How, how do you do that? Okay, here's the beautiful thing. Are you ready? It will come back to you if it, it's meant to come back to you. So it's almost as though the process of getting rid of is the forest fire that goes through the forest. And the things that remain are the good, strong oak trees, and all of the underbrush gets burned away. Um, so if the sentence is truly good, you will remember it in the next draft. I say this as a person with zero memory, none. I cannot quote a thing. I know one poem by heart, and I read po poetry every single day, right? This is bad. Um, but the things in your work that are alive, that are necessary to the story, the story will, will cling to. And, and I know that sounds really mystical. I mean, obviously I love mystics, um, but it will come back to you. And if it doesn't, that's okay because it's not necessary for the story, right? So it's, it's not um, pinning all hopes on the line or the image, um, but seeing the work as a whole as something that is larger than the line or the image always constantly and constantly working toward the thing that, that makes it come alive. Lauren, yeah. what a weird time to be on a book tour. <laughs> Thank you so very much oh. for coming it's to us. It's my pleasure. Thank here you. in St. Paul. Thank you. And thank you for being here. Yes. Wow. Thank you, brave people. And there are books for sale out in the lobby. I don't usually, you know, push the books, but we've all done something a little unusual here. Our bookseller, Matt, is out there. It'd be wonderful if you'd consider buying Lauren's book. So yes. thank you. Thank you so much for coming out. I hope I see you at Kate DiCamillo uh, at the end of September. Thank you. Thank you.